Great. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Jill, it's a great um, background you have already given of Mark chapter 2, that how Jesus actually healed many people. But this healing was different than what he did earlier, and that's what I would like to share a little bit. Look at the scenario. What's really happening uh, at this picture? That man has been lowered down because he needed healing. He was unable to walk. We don't know, probably all his life or at some point he became disabled and he was unable to walk. And he really wanted healing so that he can be healed. But Jesus really amazed people because not only Jesus healed that man, but he said something which was extraordinary. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. That was shocking statement to make. Now, most people who are around Jesus, not everybody was shocked, but specifically those who were teachers of law, scribes, they were shocked because they knew that forgiveness of sin is a prerogative to God alone. Only God can forgive sins. So why Jesus said that your sins are forgiven? And it's amazing that Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. And Jesus asked a rhetorical question. Two questions, which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven or get up and walk. And interestingly, after that, Jesus did both. He forgave his sin and then he healed that man. How that incident is relevant today in 2021 in this place in Nuremberg. I think most people who are religious, even if they are from other religious background, are Muslim friends, Hindu, Sikhs, they have that concept that there is sin, there is a divine law, and we, we need to be forgiven. But I think they will have the same problem what these Pharisees and the scribes had. Who is Jesus that who can say your sins are forgiven? Is he God? And I think that is the question is still very much relevant for people. But let me explain very briefly that how do we understand what is sin? Why that is need to be forgiven? And why Jesus said that your sins are forgiven? So what is sin? We don't use that word in everyday life. It's a religious term. We understand as a believers that uh, it's a divine law which God has stipulated in the Bible. And if we disobey, that means it's sin. But in everyday life, we don't use that word. But what about those who do not believe in God? How do they understand sin? They may not use that word, sin, but the concept is there every day, every day we wrestle with the issue, what is ethical and what is moral. Regardless what you believe, people require justice. Whether you're a football player or you are an actor, or your politician, it doesn't matter whatever status you have. If you have done something uh, unethical, morally wrong, people demand justice. And we know recently, you know, people get really, really upset with the politician that who did something ethically wrong. So people demand that person should be resigned. And when he did resign, he said, no, that is not enough. That person needs to be sacked. People are upset. People need justice. So you can see that inner being, we demand justice. We demand that we should live in a place which is morally right. And to be honest, in this earth, we will never ever get that. We are living in a fallen world. We human beings are not designed to live in this kind of world. 
we were designed, we were created to live in God's presence. And that where we need to go back. And that's what deep down people are longing for because we are designed to live with God forever. So that is sin, that why that needs to be forgiven. Imagine that uh, if someone described that morally, ethically wrong, what kind of wrongs we do. One wrong we can do, there are certain mistakes we do which are rational. You know, we can get things wrong, you know, could be geographically or mathematically, someone might be mistaken, people who have never visited UK, they sometimes think that Oxford University is in London. Uh, some people might make it question can get wrong. You don't punish that person, you just correct that. By the way, Oxford University is in Oxford, or two plus two is four, it's not five. You just correct that mistakes. But what about if person comes from another country and murder someone? And they say, oh, I didn't know that. In our country, we just for fun, we just kill someone. I was getting bored. I killed that man. No, no, you don't correct that person. That person requires punishment now. Morally wrong, ethically wrong, you cannot just correct. Inherently, there is a, some kind of a consequence. Just as I've given you that your politician make mistake or anyone, there is a consequence. And that's need to be uh, dealt with. Now, most of us, most of us, we will say we are sinner, but we are not criminal. There's a kind of a distinction. Uh, we often make. Criminal is someone who, who does serious uh, crime, murdering someone, robbery, or other kinds of uh, terrible sin. But what about those people? The vast majority of people try to justify, but I'm not criminal, I'm a good person. So just as someone who has committed a crime, there is a consequence that person go to prison, that person cannot come back to live in society again. That person has to suffer punishment if someone has murdered. You cannot come back and live with your own family, with your friends and neighbors. You will live in prison. But God also has that specific standard. And uh, we are all, we are all committed to do these kind of things. We every day we do wrong with our hands, either you're stealing or you're fighting with someone. We say unkind words and words can really damage people. Sometime for life, imagine that if you're telling your child all the time, you are hopeless, you can never get things wrong. That child will believe those words and have a very low esteem. It can damage that child's life. Words needs to be said carefully. In heart, if hands or, or mouth is saying nothing, but in heart you planning evil things. What about with mind? You see that we are living in a place that we cannot, cannot get things right with our own help. This needs to be forgiven. So if we're going to go back to God's presence, these things need to be dealt. And that's where most uh, other religious uh, beliefs have a different understanding. We believe God is so holy that he cannot let that sins unpunished. You cannot imagine that we have these kind of evil thoughts and things and we can still expect that we can go into God's presence. God is the one who is the moral lawgiver. He's the one who defines, and he's the one what punishment should be. So instead of now we can say that we suffer that punishment, Jesus took that punishment upon himself. He cannot just say that, oh, you're forgiven. Imagine that if any judge has that authority who says that, oh, you're forgiven, I'll let you go. People will get upset. Who are you to just let that person go? So that's quite clear. Now here, notice now here, the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. That is so unique, that is so different because that no one has ever made that statement 
before Jesus, any prophet was never said that. They performed miracles. Miracles was not something uh, would say impossible. God gave power to prophets and they performed amazing miracles. Moses, Elijah, lots of prophets actually performed outstanding miracles because God's hand was on them. But no prophet had that authority to say anyone, your sins are forgiven. And that was very unique only to Jesus. But how do you know that if Jesus said that your sins are forgiven, how do you know really actually forgiven? There is no clear indication here because the man he's healed, that's really great. But how do you know? Then why did Jesus use that term here, the son of man and not son of God? And many times in the New Testament, Jesus referred to himself, the son of man. So religious leader who read Torah, the Old Testament, they were aware of. So they are the one who's questioning who can forgive sins, only God alone. But now Jesus is actually telling them about the Son of Man, which is also in the Old Testament. If you see the book of Daniel, Daniel was in exile, you know, for the, they were in 70 years in exile and he had a vision. There was someone like, someone, a uh, vision, uh, like a son of man who approaches the ancients of day, which is God, and all the nations serve him and his dominion will never end. His kingdom will forever and ever. And now Jesus is pointing out those Pharisees and those scribes, actually the prophecy which was given 600 years ago by prophet Daniel is coming to come true now. And the same question, why does Pilate ask this question? Tell us, no, it's not Pilate, it's a, uh, it's a high priest ask, tell us, are you the Messiah? Then it, instead of Jesus saying, yes, I am the Messiah, Jesus basically said, and you will see the Son of Man coming on clouds. Interesting, Jesus was quoting Daniel chapter 7, 13 to 14. And we see in Isaiah 40, verse 3 probably, um, it's God who comes riding on the clouds. It's an image we use, it's God himself. So Jesus was saying this, that he is God in flesh. But again, when Jesus said this, how could he prove what he was saying is true? And sometimes people even ask that you are doing amazing miracles, that's not a problem, but what you say that uh, your forgiveness in that is really a problem for us, for Pharisees. Now you have to give a proof that uh, what you are saying is, it's a, uh, sorry. <laughs> Sorted. <laughs> now, Jesus did not perform only ordinary miracle here because people were asking, actually, why don't you perform a miracle? He said, I will give you a much yes. greater miracle. Destroy this temple and I will build in three days. Okay. And they still couldn't understand. Uh -huh. Jesus yeah. was referring to himself that even if you kill a body, I have that power okay. to, to raise. And that's why Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection is the ultimate evidence that what Jesus said is really true. He had power to raise himself from that. And that's what makes Christian faith so unique. And I think we have not until lunchtime. We have that calling to tell us. This is man's fundamental need. They need to be forgiven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Back to in God's presence. Yeah. He's going to do it through us. He's going to do through us. He has in, given us this privilege. We take that precious name to, to our neighbors, to friends. Uh, most people would not have problem. Because I know it's the question everybody needs to understand. Yeah, yeah. I need to go and some. Yeah, go and check. It's not amazing. Those of you who have yes, trust in Jesus, I'm sorry. Is that have that surety. Your I'm sins are forgiven. Which means the very reason God created us 
that we live in God's presence, we can go back now. Imagine that you were in exile, you were in Babylon, you were not able to sing anymore, your name has been changed, and you can't eat food what you used to eat back in your own country. You're longing to go back to your own country. And that's what our longing is. We are longing to go back to God's presence. Let's ask God, Lord, please help me that I would be able to communicate this fundamental truth, fundamental need of every human being that they need to be forgiven so they can go back to God's presence. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great humility. Though you are mighty king, though you had authority over angels, demons, of nature, sickness, death, yet you made yourself so humble that chose to become human. And then Lord, because you love us so much, you are willing to even give your life for us. And you were crucified. And then you were buried and then you were raised to life. Father, just as you gave boldness, to your disciples and they were passionate to tell others that what you have done for us. Father, please give us that courage. Please strengthen us, Lord, so that we can help others that who is the one who can take them back to God's presence. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen.